without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Joan Roughgarden, who will be speaking on individual-based models in ecology and evaluation, or how not to ruin a good thing. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. Um, as some of you know, I, I actually have an undergraduate degree in uh, uh, philosophy, and it's always just a great joy when I get to um, uh, shack up with uh, philosophers, and it reminds me of my, uh, my uh, childhood, I guess you might say. <laughs> So uh, I asked Michael Weisberg to review a paper for me recently, and he said uh, he would only if I agreed to give a paper in the symposium that he was organizing. And so uh, I work on uh, the evolution of social behavior. I'm not working on individual-based models, but uh, I did agree to uh, look into this literature and to, uh, offer an evaluation. So in the spirit of... Uh, philosophy um, that I was familiar with as a student when I dare say philosophers require more precision of thought than scientists. Uh, the custom in, um, in philosophy is to read a paper, whereas in science we just get up and wing it. So in keeping with local custom, I'm going to read this paper. Okay, the background. W what are increasingly <coughs> called individual-based models, or IBMs, have been used in ecology since the 1970s when theoretical ecology began in earnest. The best known examples from that time include the forest computer simulation model of Daniel Botkin and the computer simulation model of Donald DeAngelis for freshwater fish. These were identified with the systems ecology school of theoretical ecology and the approach was anticipated to offer a unifying theoretical framework for ecology. A goal, that is, the possibility of a unified framework, a goal whose possibility is still being debated. Nonetheless, since then, since the 1970s, hundreds of IBMs have been published in ecology. Moreover, IBMs are being actively developed in other disciplines, especially the social sciences. And dozens of software environments have been created to facilitate IBM research. This talk reviews progress for IBMs in ecology, details several remaining difficulties, and suggests clarification where needed. A provisional definition. For now, for the moment, an IBM is provisionally considered to be a computer simulation in discrete time steps for the creation, disappearance, and movement of a finite collection of discrete interacting entities. So the germination, growth, and death of a collection of individual trees on a plot of ground, or the birth, growth, and reproduction of a collection of individual fish in a pond would be classical examples of IBMs. Now, challenge is met. Grimm and Railsback in 2005, and for those of you just getting into this, they're key players in this IBM area, and they've written a couple books on this, uh, published from at Princeton University Press. So Grimm and Railsback detail several or seven challenges that IBMs have faced in ecology. And these are a long time needed to develop the model, difficulty in analyzing results lack of common language to communicate model and results, requirements for too much data, uncertainty and error propagation, lack of generality, and lack of standards. These are what the proponents have pointed out. <coughs> Ecological IBM modelers have faced these challenges head on. They have collectively proposed and implemented a protocol for how a model is to be specified and they have coalesced around a freely downloadable programming platform called NetLogo as a standard for developing and executing IBMs. Moreover, NetLo NetLogo can be embedded within Mathematica, thereby endowing IBM model the IBM modeling mo module with the statistical and analytical tools of Mathematica's powerful industry standard programming environment. The steps by the ecological IBM modeling peer group do go a long way to resolving many, but not all, 
of the problems that have dogged IBMs since their inception. Here are some of the remaining problems, and the rest of the talk will be about the remaining problems. First, it's a big one, exclusionary definitions. Despite their progress, ecological IBM modelers have also taken decisions that seem counterproductive. They employ an unnecessarily exclusive definition of what counts as an IBM. Grimm and Rails back following Uchmansky and Grimm in 1997 stipulate that to be considered an IBM in ecology, a model must satisfy four criteria, in addition to those mentioned uh, as part of the definition. One, detail about each individual's life cycle must be present in the model, including the growth and development of each individual as it ages. Dynamics of resources used by individuals must be explicitly represented. A carrying capacity cannot be used because it is supposedly a population level concept that cannot be known to an individual. Three, integers and not real numbers must be used to represent the size of a population. The model must feature discrete events and not refer to rates. And four, variability must be allowed and must exist among individuals of the same age. But specifically, environmental phenotypic variation, not heritable genetic variation, inasmuch as Grimm and Railsback consider evolutionary ecology as beyond the scope of ecological IBMs. These are these additional definitions um, are, are clearly exclusionary. Now here's the problem with them, among other things. They're inconsistent with the definitions in the field. So Grimm and, Ra Grimm and Rails back 2005 acknowledged that these criteria rule out many models as IBMs. Notable among the excluded models are, quote, predator-prey systems. This is from them, quote from them. Predator-prey systems with individuals as discrete units with local interactions, but no life cycles or variability among individuals. However, this criterion, unquote, this criterion conflicts with standard practice in the wider IBM community. Wolfram's Mathematica website has a demonstration by Sayama of a, quote, real-time agent-based simulation of a predator-prey ecosystem, wherein rabbits run around in a square area and are chased by foxes. Castiglione, in the Scholarpedia peer-reviewed open access uh, encyclopedia, has an entry on agent-based modeling. And it also features a direct comparison of an individual-based fox-rabbit model compared with a venerable Lotkeville Terra predator-prey model that, as you know, is formulated as a pair of coupled nonlinear differential equations. The fox-rabbit models proposed as examples of IBMs would nonetheless be ruled out as ecological IBMs by Grant, Grimm and Railsback, even though they were offered precisely as illustrations of IBMs in the wider IBM literature. OK, so why are Grimm and Railsback uh, so, so restrictive? In acknowledging that their definition is restrictive, Grimm and Railsback refer to models that seem in some respects to be IBM-ish, to have the flavor of an IBM, but are not true IBMs. And he refers to these as, quote, individual-oriented, as distinct from being an individual-based model. Why do Grimm and Railsback care so much about retaining their exclusionary definition? Because they are committed to the ideal that, quote, IBMs can lead to a fundamentally new view of ecological systems and processes, unquote. They write that unlike true IBMs, indivi quote, individual-oriented models, mere individual-oriented models, do not allow us to fully trace the system properties back to the behavior of the individual animals, unquote. The ecological IBM modelers regularly disparage what they consider the classical framework for describing ecological systems as, quote, relatively simple and characterized by system level state variables versus the IBM view that ecological processes and systems emerge from the traits of adaptive individuals. 
and they view their exclusionary definition of an IBM as necessary to accomplish this aim, uh, this revisionist aim. However, let us consider whether the restrictions are in fact really necessary to attaining a fundamentally new view of ecological systems. So I'll now present two examples of individually oriented models, but which wouldn't qualify as individual based models, but which might be sufficient to indicate a new approach to modeling. So I now review two examples that are IBM-ish, but do not satisfy Grimm and Rails back criteria and show that they do represent a fundamentally new approach to modeling ecological, uh, to, to formulating ecological models. So the first will be about a lizard, one of my favorite creatures taken from this book here. Now, this is about the optimal size, body size, of an optimal forager. In, in 1995, I published a model for how a lizard could learn to forage optimally. This was a big problem for us for many years, as to how an animal would be smart enough to know what its optimal uh, diet might be. The model predicted that there is an optimal cutoff distance, a so-called optimal cutoff distance for a lizard that's on a tree and looking out at prey, such that all prey closer than this distance are taken and all prey beyond this distance are ignored. The optimal distance is that is found, computed, as that which maximizes the lizard's rate of energy capture. And a simple algorithm was exhibited that would allow a lizard to dynamically learn where the optimal cutoff distance was. The figure there illustrates the model using parameters estimated from field data with anolis lizards in the Eastern Caribbean. The lower panel shows the optimal cutoff distance as a horizontal line. That's the horizontal line in the lower panel. Prey are appearing randomly as distance from zero to three meters away from the lizard. That is from zero all the way up to three on that graph. And the prey are just appearing at random distances from zero all the way up to three. Each vertical line represents a prey item that was chased and caught <coughs> by the lizard. Notice that the vertical lines rarely cross the optimal cutoff, and those that do are principally at the beginning of the simulation when the lizard is still learning where the optimal cutoff is. The upper panel shows how the lizard's energy capture rate within the day approaches the optimal capture rate, shown as a horizontal line in the top panel. The, the realized capture rate fluctuates initially, reflecting the lizard making mistakes by chasing insects beyond the optimal cutoff distance, or ignoring insects in front of the optimal cutoff distance. The existence and qualitative properties of the optimal cutoff distance were tested and confirmed in field studies of anolis lizards on the island of Anguilla. I would love to tell you about in more detail. <laughs> Based on this model for the daily energy capture by a lizard, the daily growth rate of a lizard could be predicted. The next figure shows a scatter plot of the lizard's daily growth increments from field data. So the dots are actual field data on how long or how much a lizard grew in a day. And on the horizontal axis is the lizard's body size. The vertical axis is how much it grew in a given day. And when the lizard's small, you can see it's growing quickly. And as the lizard gets bigger, the daily growth rates get smaller and smaller, indicating that it's starting to level off in body size. Now, so the figure shows a scatter plot of the lizard's daily growth increments from field data compared to theoretically to that theoretically predicted, assuming the lizard is an optimal forager. The open circles pertain to females and the closed circles to males. The theoretically predicted optimal curve is a solid line. So that's the a priori optimal curve is the solid line. Notice the quantitative agreement between the actual growth increments and that expected from optimal foraging theory. Females cease, females cease growing and drop off the curve when they have reached a length of about 45 millimeters. As you can see the, the uh, white circles just dropping down to zero when the body size hits 45. 
and the males drop off the growth curve at about 60 millimeters in length. These sizes are typical of adults on those eastern Caribbean islands with only one species of the knoll, the so-called solitary size. The next task is to predict why the lizards stop growing at the sizes they do in order to begin reproduction at that time. So they, when they drop off the curve, that indicates a switch from further growth into starting to reproduce at that time. So that's what's going on there. So the question is, why do they stop growing and start reproducing at a body length of 45 millimeters for females? To accomplish this, the optimal growth rate can be integrated to yield, through time, to yield a predicted curve of how the size of the lizard changes as it ages, as shown in the, the, the top figure there. This theoretically broke a uh, predicted growth curve is then com combined with field estimates of survivorship and with a maternity function predict predicted from the fecundity of an optimally foraging female as a function of the age at which she stops growth and switches to producing eggs. Further, assuming density dependence consistent with field data, showing a maximum abundance of 100 lizards per 100 square meters, or about one lizard per square meter, the steady state abundance is a function of body, body size is predicted, which is in the, hard, the, the lower figure. So, <coughs> according to density dependent natural selection theory, or so called K selection, the body size that maximizes the steady state abundance is the optimal body size. And that figure shows that the optimal body size for, for females is about 45 <coughs> millimeters. That is the evolutionarily optimal the one from life history theory, uh, and as in fact observed. This example illustrates a complete and successful modeling protocol that begins with the property of an individual and culminates in an evolutionary prediction of the adult body size for lizards on an island in the absence of congeneric predators. The logic to this model is clearly bottom-up and in the spirit of deriving population-level predictions from the explicit properties of individuals. Nonetheless, this model fails every one of the four grim rails back criteria. It would be considered, quote, an individually oriented model, but not an IBM per se. Two, another example, more brief. Population dynamics of barnacles on an open stretch of rocky intertidal habitat. Um, that's a barnacle. Uh, there's tiny little th things the size of a thimble. These occur on stretches of rock, and there must be billions and billions of them in, in a, a mile or two of rocky intertidal habitat. And these all release larvae. That's an example of <coughs> the shrimp-like larvae that they release into the water. These go out into the water and, and eat phytoplankton. And this is a schematic of the ocean currents off the coast of California and Oregon. Barnacles are small crustaceans whose adult phase lives attached to rocks in the zone between low and high tides. I mean, you might not think of that as a crustacean, but what a barnacle really is, if you imagine an adult shrimp that's lying on its back on the rock with its feet in the air, and so it waves its feet in the air and filter feeds in that way, and then the shell is elaborated around it to, to provide protection. So it's really just a shrimp lying on its back and its larvae are like shrimp larvae that are out in the water. Now, uh, these, an these animals release tiny shrimp-like larvae that live in the surface waters eating phytoplankton until they grow to a large enough size to attach to a rock whereupon they metamorphose into adults. I developed a model for the population dynamics of these organisms in 1988. In the model, one equation, so there's one equation that pertains to the rate at which larvae settle out of water onto vacant space so they have to land on vacant space. And another equation pertains to the flow of larvae in the offshore currents. So these two, equ two equations are coupled at the ocean land boundary. Together they express a model of the population dynamics of barnacles. This model, too, is formulated using a bottom-up logic based on the mechanisms for occupying space and the release of space following mortality. This model might be called mechanism-based, or an MBM, but the state variables are the number of barnacles per area of rock and the number of larvae per surface area of ocean, both of which are real numbers and not restricted to integers. This model, too, fails to satisfy any of the rail, grim rails back criteria, but could be considered individually oriented, though not an IBM as such. <coughs> 
These examples show that individually oriented models are sufficient to achieve a goal of fundamentally new view of ecological systems and processes as compared with the differential equations of classic population biology dating to the 1940s and earlier. In contrast, the IBMs as defined by Grimm and Railsback seem primarily applicable only to very large organisms such as vertebrates and trees and certainly not to barnacles with billions of them or bacteria and even then might be worthwhile only for special applications where the individuals are each specifically ta identified, tagged, and tracked. Okay, that's a long section. The next section. Another problem is that individuality is confused <coughs> with agency. The difference between an individual-based model and an agent-based model is confusing, and most workers, with most workers considering these terms to be synonymous. For example, Castiglione writes, an entity is an agent if it has some degree of autonomy, that is, if it is distinguishable from its environment by some kind of spatial, temporal, or functional attribute. That is, an agent has to be identifiable. Moreover, we further require that the agents must have some autonomy of action and that they must be able to engage in tasks in an environment without direct external control. Thus, identifiability and autonomy make an entity an agent in the IBM literature. So in this sense, agent and IBM are roughly equivalent. Agent and individual, I meant to say. Agent and individual are basically the same. Peck in 2012 writes, I follow Railsback and Grimm and make no distinction, quote unquote, between IBMs and, a and ABMs. He adds, quote, grains of sand might be considered model agents, although they do not make choices, unquote. However, I think it is better to use the term agent more narrowly to refer specifically to a goal seeking individual where the goal is to increase the individual's fitness, such as an optimally foraging lizard, mentioned above. Moreover, I require that prior to each realized action, an individual has a choice of one or more alternatives and chooses the action it carries out according to the criterion that it thinks, so to speak, its fitness would thereby increase. So to most workers, an IBM and ABM are synonymous, whereas in my definition, an ABM is a subset of IBM in which an individual chooses, chooses action to pursue the goal of increasing fitness. Choice and fitness seeking define a biological agent. Another problem. Individuality is confused with programming metaphor. The definition of an IBM that most workers employ anticipates that the model will be developed using object-oriented programming methods. The figure here is drawn from the Apple computer publication about programming for the iPhone and iPad using the language Objective-C. The idea for, say, a hand calculator application is that, here's what a hand calculator is. It's a constellation of objects, such as the number keys and the function keys, together with a viewing screen, as well as some entities called a controller and a model. So it's a collection of these things. An agent, an, an event transpires, such as someone pressing a key like seven, which triggers a controller, you see all these arrows here, which triggers a controller to cause uh, a seven to be displayed on the view. If another seven is played, the controller causes another seven to be displayed. And if a plus is pressed, the controller sends the previous numbers to a model which is a kind of object, who adds them up and sends the result back to the controller, who then causes it to be displayed. The point here is that the programming metaphor envisions, the programming metaphor envisions a bunch of interacting agents, each with unique, unique capabilities, that collectively realize a function, such as a handheld, such as a hand calculator application, a function not immediately evident from inspecting the properties of the individual agents. The notion of a hand calculator could be said to emerge from the aggregate action of the constituent components. However, what the calculator does, does in any instance depends on random events. The calculator just sits there, endlessly, so to speak, awaiting random key presses from which the user 
fr uh, from a user and then exhibiting results all without any direction. The object-oriented programming metaphor differs from the procedural programming metaphor, which is perhaps best envisioned with the analogy of a recipe for cooking. Indeed, the now classic language Pascal is explicitly set up to enforce writing a program like writing a recipe. List the ingredients at the beginning, what the variables are and what the operations are allowed on them, and then move to how the, in the ingredients are combined to produce a chocolate cake. Procedural programming envisions a directionality from input to output, from beginning to end. Both these programming metaphors are useful in ecology, but should not be confused with the issue of whether a model is formulated bottom-up versus top-down. Consider the populations comprising a food web. The figure above illustrates a simplified version of a complex food web from a terrestrial community on St. Martin in the Eastern Caribbean. Like the hand calculator previously mentioned, a community just sits there. Each one of these little nodes is an actual species. It's, lists, it's listed at the bottom. And these arrows between them are actual interactions between the species that are experimentally demonstrated to exist. So if you poke one of those species, one of the other species responds. And every one of those little links in there are links, uh, uh, represent uh, the, uh, the response to, to an experiment that was done in which one of those little things was, was poked. So the community just sits there. Something happens to one component, like a rain squall that causes insects on the forest floor to prosper, which in turn causes the kestrel to prosper and the lizards and spiders to prosper, which in turn causes increased deposition to the detritus letter, layer, and so on. The community just sits there, bubbling away without any direction. A perfect system for object-oriented programming, where the populations in the community are objects. In contrast, a biological population is a directional entity. It grows in abundance and adapts through evolution. A perfect system for procedural programming. It is ironic that object-oriented IBMs have been applied to population dynamics when the natural application of the approach is to communities. In any case, the value of the object-oriented programming versus procedural programming metaphor should not be confused with the value of a bottom-up or top, but with the value of a bottom-up individually oriented protocol versus a top-down protocol. Here are three paragraphs that were omitted from the presentation in San Diego because of time limitations. Conclusion. IBMs and ABMs originated in the 1960s when mainframe computers were first becoming available to ecological researchers. These computers provoked interest in using computer simulation for ecological modeling rather than relying on mathematical analysis. In judging the merits of model craftsmanship based on simulation versus analysis, I usually come down on the side of analysis. With simulation, it may be impossible to drill down to what assumptions are responsible for conclusions, to discern the causal connections between the initial conditions and the results. And simulation invites unsophisticated and sloppy research, together with naive hocus-pocus about the magic of emergence. Ecological workers with IBMs and ABMs not only bear the burden of avoiding an uncritical embrace of computer simulation, they risk shooting themselves in the foot. First, they propose unnecessarily restrictive definitions of what can count as an IBM, definitions that turn out to be inconsistent with usage of IBM workers in other domains. Second, they fail to distinguish between a living organism who acts through choice to increase its fitness and a dead particle. Third, they confuse taking an individual organism as the conceptual starting point for ecological theorizing. They confuse that with the choice of programming metaphor, object-oriented programming versus procedural programming. Ecological IBM and ABM workers need to clean up their act on these matters, lest they ruin a good thing. Specifically, I recommend that the following 
definitions be adopted. 1. An IBM shall be any model for which the properties of the higher level are derived from properties at the lower level. That is, an IBM is any model formulated with bottom-up logic, any model that is, quote, individually oriented, unquote. An ABM shall be any IBM in which the individuals at the lower level are goal-seeking and take actions based on choices that maximize their goal. Three, use of object-oriented programming versus procedural programming shall be considered irrelevant to the designation of a model as an IBM or ABM and shall be undertaken according to what seems most natural to the application. And now I return to the presentation as delivered in San Diego. IBMs and ABMs, as distinct from computer simulation itself, offer three new conceptual advantages. First, they emphasize and implement a bottom-up style of formulating ecological models, from lower level to a higher level, from an individual to social groups, and thence to a population, or from, organis from organs to an organism. This perspective contrasts with traditional modeling and theoretical ecology based on the logistic and Lotka Terra competition and predator-prey equations. It also contrasts widening here a bit. It also contrasts with the top-down approach to animal behavior required by Maynard Smith's population genetic-based solution for the evolutionarily stable strategy, an approach that begins with the gene pool and trickles down to individual behavior. So I regard that also as classic in its framing. Second, IBMs and ABMs stress an alternative programming metaphor for ecological systems, the metaphor of object-oriented programming rather than procedural programming. This metaphor seems best for modeling ecological communities where the objects are species united through a common food web, and not for modeling populations whose dynamics still seem best represented through a procedural programming metaphor that represents the directionality of population growth and natural selection. Third, finally, the use of IBMs strongly endorses taking the individual as the fundamental or first class object for ecology and evolution. <laughs> Working up from the individual to populations and communities or down from the individual to the genes within them. <coughs> Resting evolutionary theory on ABMs would contrast starkly with population genetics that takes the gene as the fundamental object and works up from there to phenotype and population and beyond. The agent-oriented approach in ecology contradicts the widely shared perspective in evolutionary biology that, as Dawkins articulated, quote, our genes made us, we animals exist for their preservation and are nothing more than their throwaway survival machines. Instead, according to agent-based ecology, whole individuals are the primary actors on the evolutionary stage and the genes within them but a stage crew of temporary workers hitchhiking along for the evolutionary ride. Okay, thank you. Do we have time so just, have just for a few minutes specific? Yeah. yeah. Thanks for a great talk. At the end, you mentioned that for certain traits, it's better to, well, you didn't say traits, but for certain things. Yeah, problems. Yeah, it's yeah. better to, to go to population genetics. So you, you seem kind of a pluralist saying, we need to take seriously individuals, but population tools are still very useful for certain types of problems. Oh, yeah. Now, how would you, for a given trait, like just heuristically, how would you go about deciding where to start? Well, I, I, one, I think... One or the other. Yeah, you have to I, choose. I think the philosophically interesting criteria here would be um, directionality and, and agency. I mean, uh, I, th I think what's being raised by IBMs, which is philosophically interesting, it, and, and we're al al almost stumbling on it, onto it because of this you know, all of this talk about IBMs, is when do we actually envision that the action we want to model uh, has, so to speak, intention behind it? When, when is there agency? And, and then secondly, is, is there direction? 
<coughs> so the, the contrast I'm making, for example, with the with the community or the eco, the ecosystem, <coughs> no one really has any idea of ecosystems going anywhere or community. Early on, there was a notion of community development leading to the climax community, which had a kind of directionality. But typically, it, certainly when you get a climax community, it just sits there. And um, the food web just represents all these connections, and that's that. <coughs> so there's no point in using uh, a, a, a directional metaphor there. There's no direction. But in the case of population, population you know, starts small and they grow. And so, so you write then a differential equation which has an, is an independent variable time. And time means you know, direction. And uh, so that, that's what I would really focus on is, it, is there directionality and, and is there <coughs> fitness maximizing? Is there agents, is there choice and fitness maximization in it? And uh, is that it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. One more and then one more and then we'll go to the next paper. Okay. I, I um, thank you for a very interesting talk. I didn't, um, I'm not sure I understood the very last point you made the third of your three advantages of uh, yeah. the, this approach, um, saying taking the uh, these individuals uh, and population emerges out of them and the genes are, are lower. The thing I didn't understand is that you could do an individual-oriented model of higher level things or lower level things if you wanted. So or you could do it of a gene, for example. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, so help me. Uh, I didn't. I obviously didn't quite understand what you were trying well, to say. Well, <laughs> that's a good point. I had thought of doing an individually oriented model for a gene, so so one could do that. But the the stress of the ecological uh, context right here is that it's actually the organism that's important, and so going with that context, it would argue that in, in what it what it points to is that I think as an ecologist, and I've always been very very worried about taking genes as the primary object right here because. It's, it's the, the organism has to get the resources, has to survive and all of that. And then I've been very impressed with uh, how the traits are invariant to genetic substitution a whole lot. I remember when I was writing uh, one of the books sub summarizing sexual differentiation and, and it was the, it's the case that the that male and female, for example, in lizards uh, are determined by different chromosomes in some islands, but not in other islands, but the ovaries are exactly the same. And the testes are exactly the same. So you get the same morphology, you get the same structures, but it doesn't matter what the hell the genes are. You know, you have to have some genes there that are really good and that produce it, but there's all this scrambling around for the controlling genes. And, and so the whole, whole metaphor we grew up with in the 60s was that genes control one of genetic control of the phenotype and so on. And, and the, or, the individual organism perspective says, well, what's the environment, you know, the ecological perspective in it basically is that the environment has sent out a call for proposals, so to speak. The environment is there. You know, they, it knows what it wants. And it, and it wants somebody to, to, to scrounge around for food or somebody to work to look for food at night. And so it puts out a call for proposals, and then the organisms mutate and do whatever they do, and they conjure up some genes which deliver on the call for proposals. And then the best uh, proposals wind up, you know, surviving. But but the genes we down we we background the genes instead of foregrounding the genes. And the the overall import I think of individual based models is to foreground the individual and background the genes in contrary to the way we, we do it now. It turns out that one of the ways you could demonstrate that the gene details don't matter is to have an indivi individual based model at, or oriented model at the level of the genes and then show that you've got the same traits even though there can be lots of changes down here. Well, that's right. That would be a great product. Yeah, that would be just great. <laughs> I'd love to see that. <laughs> and then one final question. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So then we'll have general discussion after, yes. after the next so one. So it's been good to go. question about what didn't appear in either. <clears throat> so when I built individual based models, I do it largely because I think the population level model imposes 
dependency, or actually more commonly the independency, um, that I don't like. I don't, I don't think it's biologically realistic. Um, so I was just curious about Joan's view, um, whether or not you have a view about the imposition, if you, if, whether or not it's the case that, that population level models impose or fail to impose dependencies that really ought to be there. Um, at the, consider the organismal view. They're, they're called the connections, right, that, that um, make what happens to one organism dependent on what happens to the other, that you're forced to ignore that population. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I agree personally <laughs> uh, with uh, the, the overall procedure of, of, of bottom-up uh, framing of population models, unless you can get away with something that's awfully coarse. Um, in, uh, like in a lot of resource management problems where you're trying to find the optimal uh, harvesting rate, um, you might be able to get away with a logistic equation. But uh, that's not really a research uh, problem. And uh, it seems to me as though uh, the uh, classic population models uh, will always be with us, like uh, plain geometry. And, but I, I don't think that's exactly where the yeah where, where the action is. I mean, the action is in making making them bottom up and then looking for commonalities. Uh, I actually wrote a, uh, a review article several years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, looking at a whole slew of individual based, or well, individual oriented models, a, a mechanism framed models for all kinds of systems and compared them to the logistic equation. And a lot of them were approximatable by a logistic equation, but you'd use the individual oriented model to provide submodels for the parameters in a logistic equation, for example. So instead of stipulating that R and K were primary parameters, you'd understand them as being shorthand for a whole slew of parameters at the individual level, which fr from which you derive R and K. And then, um, but if you're interested in a in a sort of generic policy statement, like is there uh, uh, an optimal harvest rate, and how does it depend on, say, the discount rate in the wider economy? Well, just as a toy exercise, sure, why not use the logistic equation to do that? But if you're actually trying to model tuna fish, um, you know, no way. Does that, does that speak to your point? Yeah, so I was just curious that, yeah. that, that I, I didn't see that sort of explicitly in the, um, but, but maybe I just missed it there. Yeah. 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 I just wondered whether, um, something that hasn't come up in, in, in the talk well, is about kind of just the methodology of, of modeling and what strikes me about like individual based models is is they're often amazingly fun like interesting to explore and like you can just say say you've got an ant model like this and you go, I wonder what would happen if like some of the ants were slower than other ants or if the ants met some other ants that were foraging from another nest and you, there's a kind of ability to like play with the models and, and especially with the computational resources we've got today and it seems I wonder whether that plays a role in the popularity of the models as opposed to just the, like it, it's something about you can use them to explore ideas very quickly and more generally than using kind of like, sets of, like a set of equations, I don't, I don't know how that. Well, well I, I do have a feeling about that, but that's, that cuts both ways because it means that people who are very unsophisticated at modeling <laughs> <laughs> can, can easily An play games. Point. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so you end up with screensavers rather than screensavers. <laughs> <laughs> well put. <laughs> and uh, so, the, and that, and that, why I think it's what um, the, the workers in this field have confronted that, uh, yeah, and yeah. I think that's it's to really their great, credit. Yeah. So trying to have standards and trying to have a, a, a programming platform. But um, uh, and, and there's a certain mathematical facility that you need to, to, to do that kind of playing with analytical models. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the syntax, I have to say, in Mathematica is truly dreadful. And so, yeah, as a programmer, I would agree. Yeah, and uh, when I've had to teach modeling, I've always used MATLAB, which I don't prefer, to Mathematica, which I think is 
more of a professional tool because I've been truly afraid to face student uh, evaluations after trying to teach <laughs> Mathematica. I think it would be devastating. And, uh, and so therefore you have to, for, for pedagogical reasons, you know, drift to something which perhaps doesn't really prepare students for uh, what they'll need in a in later in a research environment. But, uh, but still, if you get people asking the what if question, and if you do that with individual based models, just getting people started asking what if questions, that's a great step forward. So, um, I think you've done it. You're right to bring that up. It's not just playing, it, it gets playing, it gets yeah. fun into asking questions. Yeah. So we should move yeah. on to the yeah. second half of our symposium.